start off, I love this, it's so intimate. Um, first of all, we're in a great place, right? Um, to be able to have this conversation about taking care of our temple in a place in which this brother David ensures that individuals take care of their temple, right? Um, I think it's extremely important two things. One, to give thanks for Cheryl for even coming to me with this. She had mentioned this to me. Um, we talked about this last year, but I've been extremely busy. And, but that's been my sister, man. And she's really um, helped me out in many ways. She said, brother, we need to really start this lecture series. And with everything I had going on, I said, let's make it happen, right? So for her, let's go ahead and give her a hand, please. And as, well, as well, we want to go ahead and give Brother David a hand, one, for such a, um, an important lecture, and also provide the space, right? You know, and we really appreciate that. Um, for me, um, information is like booty holes. Everyone has some, right? right? Let's be clear. Come on now. Everybody has some information, right? Based on, we have Brother David is basically, he takes care of the temple in terms of exercise, right, and nutrition. But clearly, he has a different paradigm on how you take care of the temple. Um, I'll speak to you from an autobiographical standpoint. And what do I mean by that? Let me start by introducing myself and let you know my journey on my path of healing. Before I begin, I think it's always important in the African condition. I am 42 years young. If anybody's older than me, I need to ask the elders for permission to speak. Is there anybody here older than that? May I have permission to speak? Absolutely. Thank you. So anything I say from this point, you take it up with the elder. <laughs> Got you? That's how we deal with that. That's, that's the reason why you do that. You take it up with him. Um, so my journey. This podium, I... Clearly, and I appreciate Shell and Steve putting this together and purchasing it. I use this for my notes because I have a lot of information. I hope individuals brought writing utensils and something to write with. If you did not, Queen, can you do me a favor? My notebook, I want to make sure you pass it for those that want notes because I've got a lot to say. So if you find yourself wanting to write some things down, you definitely want to be able to have those things, okay? So for me, my journey started about 17, 18 years ago. Um, up until the age of 25, um, I actually lived primarily on what you call a soul food diet and a sad diet, standard American diet, right? With most of we ate what was available. We ate what our mama, grandmama, granddaddy, and auntie <laughs> fixed for us, right? Uh -huh. um, most of the time in eating these type of foods, we know not what these foods consist of or what they do to the temple, right? Mm -hmm. I was the same way. Um, I was born legally blind in my left eye. About 21, 20 in my left eye. My right eye wasn't that much better. It was 2060. I suffered from severe allergies. Now, when I say severe, I use that very carefully. I mean, from the month of end of May to the beginning of April to June, it was a wrap. I couldn't go outside. Now, I know you've known somebody with allergies like that. The moment they step up, they sneeze and their eyes are coughing and what have you. I suffer from that from the, as an adolescent all the way up until I changed my life, right? I had skin problems, pimples, boils, acne, and the whole nine. And weight, I had weight issues. Um, I used to be into weights, but I was into eating everything else up until the age of 25. And I was about, I would say, a little close to 200 pounds, 199 pounds. I'm about 163 pounds now, so I've kept 35 pounds off for 17 years, right? And I'll share with you what it is that I know, because what's extremely important is that we have to be food scientists. We have to understand on every level of what I like to call people's activity, from economics, education, entertainment, health, labor, law, politics, sex, and war, we are attacked. People are attacked, particularly African people. We're on the bottom of that social hierarchy. Let's be real clear about that. And because we're attacked, it means that we have to understand what, what the attack is, when is it coming, and be scientists about what do we do to basically ameliorate or lessen our problem. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the title of this lecture is Becoming One with Your Temple. Now for me, you're here listening to me speak, but I have conversations. 
We have 15 people in this room, so I'm going to be asking questions, and I hope to get answers from you. We're going to dialogue, right? Yeah. This is not a monologue. So we're going to have a conversation. So when you're looking at this title, Becoming One With Your Temple, what does that really mean? Can somebody help me with that? To you, what does that mean, becoming one with your temple? Yes, ma'am. Getting to understand your own body and to learn how to take care of yourself. You, you really are the leader in that. Nobody else can really do that but you. Come on now. Anybody else? I think she said it. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yes, beautiful. See, this whole idea, we are in the fourth dimension, right? Everybody remember Twilight Zone? Every now and then they would get in the fifth dimension and everything tripped out would happen, right? But in the fourth dimension, you came back to reality. In the fourth dimension, you are really told to stay grounded and not to really play with anything that is spiritual, right? But you can't deal with the black church that way. The black church always has God on the mind, right? You are always connected to something larger than you, right? We've lost that in terms of our responsibility on taking care of our temple. Let me help you with that. This term, human, right? This is actually a combination of two words. Hue, H-U-E, which means earth, and man. Yeah, patriarchy. This hatred towards the woman. The man basically gets the credit. So you become a human. But why not you, one man, right? We're having that same conversation. We are of the earth. Which means that we have a responsibility to be in tune with the earth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility to be in tune with the earth. If we examine in classical Africa, there's a term in Nile Valley, what we know as ancient Egypt, its original name, Kemet. There's a term called Necheru. Now, Necheru was the manifestations of nature. Now, nature will be the word that's equivalent to God. Right? That all seeing, that omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent being, right? Neturu is the manifestation of that. The sun, moisture, air, the earth, the sky. This term, Neturu, which is African in its origin, the Greeks took this word and they turned it into natura. Natura is what it was in Greek. And then we see subsequently later on in English, this word natural becomes what? Nature. 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 Which means you have a direct connection to be in tune with these forces that we see, be it the tornado, the rain, the snow, what have you. You have to be in tune with that. Are y'all with me? All right. Now let's get into this. Further asking ourselves on how do we stay connected with the earth we have to basically identify the facts. 70% of the human body is made up of what? Water. 71% of the earth is made up of what? Water. Which gives you a direct connection. Right? This term spirit. You take the English term spirit and you tie it to this Latin word spiritus. Could anybody tell me what that spirit means? Anybody? It means to breathe. All this conversation of spirit that we have, it's okay to tie it to organized religion, but really what you're talking about is learning how to manipulate the breath to breathe. Because the more you deep breathe, the more you feel closer to God. Ask anybody who does yoga every day. Ask anybody who does deep breathing every day how they feel when they stop breathing, when they manipulate the breath. Which basically tells us we need to be more in tune with that. So with all this said, we have a responsibility. As humans, people of the earth, we have a responsibility to what? Remain connected with nature. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. So let's go on this analogy. Brother David talked about this analogy of a car. Now listen, I don't want y'all in front in here. I want to know who got the baddest ride in here. Who cherishes their car? Name me a nice car. I got a beat up 1999 Honda Civic. I got a hoop. So I can't count. <laughs> Does anybody have a nice car? I'm not judging. Help me out here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's a no no to you. I'm not judging you. I'm asking you what it is. Work with me. It's a BMW. It's a BMW. Beautiful. BMW. Now, do you get your car serviced or does your husband? You make sure you get it serviced? Beautiful. So, every three months, or as the mechanics say, 3,000 miles, what do you do? You do the oil change, right? And you spend how much from that? Anywhere from $29.99 if you got a coupon. To $54.95 when they actually put a different name to get some more money. Are you with me? Right? We do this. But if you look at the engine of a car, 
It is the microcosm of the internal digestive system. What do I mean? It is a smaller version of what's going on in the body. Humans create replications of themselves. A computer, it's the human body on the inside. A car is the human body on the inside. We spend that money on that car. So in order to get there from point A to point B, we're going to make sure we change that oil. <laughs> right? But what's so interesting, right? Is that we spend that money on it. That car is the smaller version of ourselves, but we do not change our oil. Right? And we know we don't change our oil because many of us get sick every three to four months at the change of the season. Oil change time. We get sick because we're not changing our oil. And it's important that we do that. So we must cleanse our temple to be able to change our oil and eventually be balanced, right? Are y'all with me? Yeah. So I need a mathematician. I see, is that an iPhone, sis? Is that an iPhone? <laughs> is, do you have a calculator on it? Beautiful. This is going to be my mathematician, okay? So why is the system clogged up in the first place? We're going to go after that, right? We're going to go after why it's clogged up. One of the things is our meal intake is disproportionate to our bowel movements. Sister, can you get your calculator? <laughs> so let's do this math. The average person, and we won't talk about those who fit people like they were saying four to five meals a day. Let's just say average, what we're taught in America. How many meals does the average person eat a day? Three. Three, right? You eat three meals a day. Sadly, you might go once. You may go once. <laughs> I had clients that don't have bowel movements, but every, once every two to three days. But I'm gonna give us the benefit of the doubt, right? So in one day, we eat three meals. We only have one bowel movement. We're gonna deal with this week. In one week, we eat 21 meals, but we only have seven bowel movements. Okay. That's 14 bowel movements unaccounted for in a week. Wow. Are you with me? Come on now. <laughs> in one month, you have eaten 84 meals. We're not talking about your late night snacks. We're talking about the meals. But you only had 28 bowel movements. 56 bowel movements unaccounted for in one month. In one year, one year, 1,008 bowel movements, I'm sorry, 1,008 meals, you only have 336 bowel movements, which means 672 bowel movements are unaccounted for. Now this is where my mathematician will come in. So here's the scenario. We have a person who's 40 years young. Now we know in the black community and at home, you probably start eating table food at one. Right? Well, we're going to get the benefit of the doubt. We're going to say 30. We, we, know, we know you eat table food before 3, but we're going to say 3. Right? So a 40-year-old individual began to eat table food at 3 years old. That's a 37-year time span. Sis, can you times that times 1,008? That's 37 years times 1,008 meals equals how many meals in that lifespan? I'm sorry. That's okay. 37, 1,008. 37,296. 37,296. That's a lot of meals. I mean, you got your eat on, right? This is what you do. But let's deal with these bowel movements. Can you add this number up, please? 336. That's how many bowel movements you have a year. Times 37. What's that math, sis? Oh my now let's get to our point. Can you subtract this for me? 37,296, which is the total mills. mills. Subtract 12,432 bowel movements. And what is our number? 24,864. There's almost 25,000 meals in your 40 year time span that you cannot account of. Where is it? Where else? 
in your blood, see, there's something in your colon, large and small intestine called what? Auto intoxication. Right? Auto intoxication means whatever is in there and it did not move, the blood gets thick, it gets sludged, and what happens? You get sick. It's called dis ease. Right? It's called dis ease. So you have to be able to be very clear about that. If I can ask you, what is the largest organ in the body? Can somebody help me with that? The skin. And what do we do about that? What do we do to help our skin out? David mentioned one of the things we should do, one of the three is what? You got to get that heart rate up. Because when you get that heart rate up, you sweat, right? The dirt toxins up. What, what I recommend, there's several things I recommend. One is, my queen and I, we do, we're religious. Every week we do about two to two and a half hours of steam room and sauna. You must sweat that skin and make sure you're hydrated, but you must sweat, sweat, sweat. Another thing you can do is skin brushing. Skin brushing takes care of two things. One thing it does is it basically brings fluidity to your lymphatic system, which gets trapped up through all eating all the garbage. Another thing does, it basically gives your skin that shiny, and it allows the fluidity to go in there. Are y'all with me so far? Yeah. I'm saying a whole lot, but we're going to get there. Okay? I want to spend a little time on the liver. Cheryl spoke about the liver. David mentioned some things in speaking about the liver indirectly, but it's extremely important. The liver is the second largest organ in the body. It's the second largest, but it is the largest gland. It has over 500 functions. This is why it's so important. If you take the R of liver, you have what? Without the liver, how many people you know when they had liver disease, they've been able to live? Not they very die. many. They die, yeah. Not very many, because there's over 500 functions. Now, the function of the liver is simple. One of the things that it does, was very important, is it produces bile, that green substance. And what this does, this aids in the digestion in processing lipids, or what we know as fats, right? This is what it does, and this is where it's stored in the gallbladder. However, the biggest misconception is cholesterol. What we don't know but what many of us don't know is that the liver produces 80% of the cholesterol that the body needs. The other 20 is produced by red and white blood cells. Now we hear these conversations about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, right? HDL, high density lipoprotein, is good cholesterol. LDL, Low density lipoprotein is bad cholesterol. But that good and bad has nothing to do with what you get in the store. The reason why they call it good and bad is because you got to realize that the blood is flowing from the heart and going back to the other organs and the other glands. It is the liver that assists in this work because it is the LDL, that bad cholesterol, that is taken away by the HDL. To bring it back to the liver to recycle itself. Are y'all with me? Yes. This is a conversation. It's an internal conversation. Which means all the cholesterol that the body needs is produced internally. Any cholesterol you eat. Any cholesterol. There's no such thing as good external cholesterol. When you eat that, you have problems. And it'll take place. Okay? Now... I always say this analogy, animal foods, the eating of them, they close arteries. Plant foods, they open arteries, and we'll deal with that. Simply put, in my estimation, I told you it's been um, about 17, 18 years that I've basically been a vegan. No more allergies. Wow, yeah. I see without glasses, perfectly. I've been able to heal myself. I was trained with a $100,000 education for free from a naturopathic physician, Dr. Ilan Bomani, when I was in California. We've healed hundreds, close to a thousand of people of AIDS, diabetes, high blood pressure, by the same regimen that I do. So I don't speak from a faith. 
I don't speak from what I believe. I'm an avid reader, but most importantly, I've done the work and I've been able to heal others. So I speak from that standpoint, and I think it's important for me to say that. This is the Lee's liver. Does anybody here have allergies? You know allergies is your liver is in a diseased state? That's all it is. It's just your liver. They don't tell you that at the doctor because they're too busy getting you drugs that's hurting the liver. See, the liver is in a dis eased state, right? Mm -hmm. There's something called histamines. Mm -hmm. right. Now, histamines are the mediators that are in the liver. And their job is rally to support the immune system. What happens is with a person who's allergic, be it to foods, be it to the season, these histamines get released at an exorbitant rate. And this is why you have that feeling of allergies is because the histamines are going radical within your system, right? I'll go to allopathic medicine. Let's deal with these over-the-counter drugs and these prescription drugs. Claritin. You ever heard them called antihistamines? Mm -hmm. Claritin and Sudafed, mm -hmm. right? You can't stay up. They help you, right? But you can't stay up because what they do is they what? They mask the problem, but they treat the symptom, right? But what happens in this liver, my research has shown me that it is the ingestion, the de common denominator is the ingestion of dairy products that causes this liver. Every client that I've got off dairy, every client that I've got off meat, within a couple of months, boom, there's no more allergies. The proof is in the pudding. So what things can you do? I'm telling you a lot about that. Let me help you on how, what you can do to clean this liver up. First thing is you want to basically take herbs. There are three herbs that will help you tremendously in helping your liver out. Number one is milk thistle. Number two is dandelion root. You can do it in the root or you can do it in the flower. And last but not least, burdock. Burdock. And preferably if you can get it raw. And you know how you get fresh burdock? Go to these Asian stores. They know the secrets. Yes, they don't have Chinatown for nothing. That's right. You see, you don't see them at Mercy. You don't see them. Somebody told me that they basically pull it too much. Huh? There we go. Gotcha. So you don't see them. You don't see them, right? Because they understand. Go to the Asian markets and you'll find burdock. Another thing is you want to eat fresh fruits, particularly acidic fruits. Why acidic fruits? Because the acidic fruits, correct. The acidic fruits are acidic when you taste them, but they turn into alkaline when you eat them. Oh, really? And they remove excess mucus from the body. Wow. That same excess mucus that causes issues in the liver. From my estimation, lay off the flesh. Lay off of it. Lay off of it and you won't have an issue. Put yourself on a two-week time span and just get off that flesh and get off that dairy and see what happens. Then just have to struggle what tastes good and what you miss. Because that's what the real issue is. The real issue ain't if you need to have it or not, is do you miss it? Did that commercial make you want to eat it again, right? <laughs> that's the truth. Another thing is you want to stop eating so late at night. Stop it. Because when you eat late at night, you have to understand something. The body is a clock. From one in the morning to three in the morning, the liver is at its height. It's working at its height. If you eat something at 10 o'clock at night, it takes four hours to digest. At 2 o'clock in the morning when it's trying to digest, the liver's at work. And guess what? That liver gets clogged up. Those histamines get clogged up. You can't produce bile. You got issues. And most people got that. You with me? Coffee enemas. She has spent a lot of time on coffee enemas. I'll just say something real quickly about coffee enemas. She is correct. First, it has to be organic. Why does it have to be organic? Because when you have something that's inorganic in terms of coffee, it has a lot of fillers in it, which causes allergic reactions, right? You cannot drink the coffee and expect the same results. Why? Coffee, just like eating dairy and flesh, for women is estrogen rich, and for men is testosterone rich, which causes issues in the uterus, for women, and issues in the prostate for men. Are y'all with me? Yes. It's a science. This is a simple science. So when you were taking these coffee animals, rectally, that vibe.
valve that Cheryl talked about that comes from the anus, it goes across the colon all the way to this called the enterohepatic valve. The enterohepatic valve goes straight to that liver and it does its work. And I'm telling you, don't do it at night if you got to go to work because you're not going to sleep. So wake up in the morning, do it so you can have any OG. And I tested it. I'm probably going on about 45 minutes to an hour of sleep right now based on that. But it's all good. I've been doing it all good, right? Okay, let's move on. Let's deal with these classical nips, right? Now, there's a lot of stuff. As a, as a scholar, um, Cheryl mentioned I'm a PhD candidate in Africana Studies at Temple University, which is African and African American Studies. I am about the books. I'm about the knowledge. I have not shared them with you because we don't have the time. I'll get into them. But what I promise everyone here is I have a suggested reading list that will blow you away. There's nothing that I'm saying right now that I can't tell you to show you where the studies are. The only reason I didn't bring it, I don't feel like carrying my suitcase on the books. But I got you. I promise. If you legibly put your name on that paper, you will get everything that I have in terms of books so you can do your own research because it's not about what one person says, it's what about you research and do, right? Mm -hmm. These classical myths in terms of nutrition is what I want to deal with. Yeah. Our first myth I call the million dollar question. Can anybody help me? What do you think that myth is? Take a guess. What's that question? I'll give you a hint. What do meat eaters always ask vegetarians? Protein. Can you ask the question? Ask it in a question for me, sis. What, what are Where do you answer? get your protein? If you eat meat, where do you get your protein? When? What's the answer? Check out these statistics. There's a book by Paul Pitchford called Healing with Foods. And he did an extensive data analysis. He did an extensive research on it. And what he showed, and I'll share this. I got the chart and everything for you. Her serving of food. Now, they usually do serving when we're dealing with meat is three and a half ounces, right? So, in serving for food, guess where the most protein comes from? Can anybody guess? Help me out. Where do you think the most protein comes from? From which source? Be specific. What type of vegetable? Greens. Hmm? That's close. Anybody heard of microalgae? Oh, seaweeds. You ever heard of spirulina? I heard of spirulina. Chlorella. At the highest of it is marine phytoplankton. They don't tell us that much about that one, but that's the one you really want to spend. It costs you probably $140 for 10 ounces. Yes, ma'am? Paul Pitchford. It's P-I-T-C-H-F-O-R-D. And it's healing with foods. So our highest form of protein comes from microalgae. And what we find out at the top of that list is spirulina has 68 grams of protein per serving. Number two on that list, interestingly enough, is nutritional yeast. Not brewer's yeast. Nutritional yeast, high in vitamin Bs. It has 50 grams of protein. Number three, soybeans. You know it's when you got the meat yet, right? <laughs> soybeans is 35 grams per serving. When it comes to our flesh, the number one on the list is tuna. There are 25 grams of tuna per three and a half ounce serving. So no, no gold, no silver, no bronze. Flesh, as we know it, fish is 29. Chicken is next on the list. You get 16 to 24. Beef is 17 to 21. And interestingly enough, sunflower seeds Sesame seeds and almonds all have more protein in it than meat. Wow. So you have to ask yourself, wow. what is it? This is not about me telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. What you have to understand that the forces that are lobbying that basically spend spent billions of dollars yeah. to get you to eat something that is not basically putting you in tune with nature. Wow. And they're making business. Because if you go back at the beginning of the 20th century, the only people that was having high blood pressure, heart disease, and what they call high sugar or what we know diabetes today were only the wealthy people. Because yeah. they were eating high functions of meat. People that were poor could not afford meat. So it was a very, very low, low, low heart disease rate, cancer rate or what have you. So it is through the overconsumption of this flesh that causes our diseases. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Myth number two. Before I eat this myth. 
And y'all keep it real with me. Let's say on your way out this morning, you was walking to come here. And you step out on your porch. And you go into your car, the bus, or what have you. And you look down and you see a little puppy. But this puppy is sucking on the nipples of a grown cat. Now you see this. Yes. What's your first thought? Wrong. So wrong. Something wrong here, right? <laughs> Why is this puppy sucking on this cat's nipple for nourishment? <laughs> two different species. <laughs> right, but two different species, though, right? It doesn't happen, right? You don't see that in nature. Say it again, sis. Why do we drink cow's milk? Somebody told you to? Yeah. Statistics shows that other than dominant people, the majority of them, 80 to 90 percent, are lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. But we love that cheese. Okay. We like that ice cream. <laughs> Which means that you are being geared to take milk because if you watch the commercial, it does what? Does it does about it. Right? Oh. We have to be very clear with this. Dairy products, in my estimation, can be referred to as liquid meat. Yeah. It, can, it contains as much fat and external cholesterol is red meat. It comes from the cow, don't it? Yeah. Mm. Drinking three <laughs> glasses of milk. Hear me now. Drinking three glasses of milk is equivalent to having the same cholesterol as eating 21 pieces of bacon. Oh, wow. wow. What? Wow. This is dairy. Get off dairy for two weeks and see what happens. See what happens. Eating a pint of ice cream, statistics say it's the same thing. You love it, but see, we know what that ice cream is for most people. That becomes your boyfriend or your girlfriend, right? Things ain't right, you said. Briars, Hagen dazs you can it's a comfort, right? So true. But it's something about eating things that are comforting are not so good for the temple. And if you have a toxic emotion while you're eating them, you are actually covering that food with what? An emotion that's toxic in which it doesn't get to digest. But that's a whole other conversation. The truth about calcium. Let's deal with this. This is big business, people. Yes, One trillion dollars a year the beef and dairy industry spends on lobbying. One trillion dollars a year. They are here to teach you that dairy products give you calcium. It produces, it helps you with calcium. Nothing can be further from the truth. Because if you understand calcium, what does calcium basically do? Calcium requires the absorption of vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin D. All in which cow's milk cannot give you. Why is that? Vitamin D supplements, sorry. There is a guy by the name of Louis Pasteur. He's a Frenchman that created this pasteurization process, and that's the worst thing that happened to us. Because when you realize there is no calcium in this milk, this milk has to go through a pasteurization process which means they cook it over 116 degrees. And anything cooked over 116 to 18 degrees, you kill all the nutrients and the vitamins. That's why they put that sexy sign or that sexy phrase on there, vitamin fortified. You know what vitamin fortified means on that milk? They inject it with synthetic vitamins. So when you're drinking this cow's milk, you are drinking synthetic vitamin C, synthetic vitamin D, synthetic vitamin A. Why do that when all you have to do is go after calcium? And we'll go after that in a second, okay? So we have to realize with all this dairy lobbying going on, they spent last year, in 2012, they spent over $9 million in lobbying dairy. Which means that the same people that are selling the calcium are the same people that are setting the requirements on what dairy is. Do you hear me? Yes. And then they have our babies in the school system making it mandatory for them to drink milk. It's genocide nutritionally. Mm -hmm. Myth number three. Now, I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to tell people what you should do and what you shouldn't do. To each his own. Really, in terms of this meat thing. But the myth that chicken and fish is healthier, forget about it. <laughs> healthier than what? <laughs> not beef, not pork. It's all flesh. When you're dealing with, this is what flesh does to the temple. Now, this is not excluding exercise. Exercise helps. You need to exercise. Exercise will assist in what I'm about to say. It truly will. Sweating will assist. But when you're eating flesh, 
Flesh breaks down and becomes excess mucus. Mucus comes from mucin. Mucin is the natural element in your body that lubricates all your membranes and your organs to keep things flowing so there won't be friction. But when you're eating this flesh, it becomes excess mucus and you have problems. So this whole idea of chicken and fish being healthy is nonsense. For example, three piece, three and a half piece of ounce of steak. This is that serving, right? 75 grams of cholesterol. Now let me ask you, the body produces cholesterol, correct? Yeah. All the cholesterol you need. So anything you eat that cholesterol is going to give you imbalance. The chicken has 75 grams. I mean, the beef has 75 grams. Guess what? Chicken is only 3 grams less than that. 72 grams of it. Now, we're talking about fish. Eat the fish. The fish is good for you, right? But statistically, what you find out is that calorie for calorie, fish has 6 times more cholesterol than beef. It's not recorded. That's crazy. It got knocked out. That's okay. As long as y'all got You want to pause? Yeah. Okay. The cord came out, so it's probably not recording. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah.